welcome, welcome, welcome to our delightful and super awesome panel that we are about to begin. Um, in case you're in the wrong place, this is what puzzles in games do. So if you are lost, please relocate to the appropriate location. Um, if you are here to find out what puzzles in games do, welcome. We are in Swooperton B on the Discord. And if you happen to be on Twitter and feel like following along or live tweeting, uh, the hashtag is game puzzles. So, Thank you all for joining us. And now I'm going to have our esteemed panelists introduce themselves. I will introduce myself quickly. I'm Valerie Valdez, author of Chilling Effect, Prime Deception. I am a gamer and not a game maker. And so I will speak little, but ask questions of these awesome game makers. Uh, first, let's start with Curtis. Hi, I'm Curtis C. Chen. I am a writer and also a puzzle and game maker. I'm one of the co-founders of Puzzle Pint, which is a monthly event that's been happening since 2010, now happens in, well, now it's online, but uh, pre-pandemic, we were in about 80 cities around the world and generating original content every month. So I can talk about, you know, what it's like to make a puzzle-centric event, and then as a, I've run other events that are more like games with puzzles in them, and, and of course, also gamer. Um, yeah. And I love Bowery's books, so you should check them out. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> All right, uh, Kieran. Hi, I'm Kieran Roberts. Uh, I'm a producer with Six to Start, who make an audio fitness game called Zombies Run. I, in my spare time, I have some for some reason started making uh, escape games. So I make little escape games in a bag and start putting them together using twine. And I also play a lot of video games. <laughs> awesome, awesome, awesome. Um, Andrew, last but very much not least. Um, thank you. I am Andrew Plotkin. Uh, I come out of the uh, the text adventure game world where I've been writing games for a long time, uh, like uh, Spider and Web, Shade, Hadian Lands. I also have a really early classic Mac game called Systems Twilight. And I am the person who uh, once at a mystery hunt uh, set a puzzle on fire because I thought there might be secret writing on it. <laughs> That's awesome and epic and also probably not what they would wanted you to do. <laughs> All right. Okay. So this is an awesome group and these are, this is going to be super fun. Uh, so the first question to just repeat the panel title, what do puzzles in games do? What are some of the different purposes puzzles can serve depending on the type of game? And we are gonna go reverse order and I'm gonna ask Andrew to start if that's all right. Sure. Um, well, I mean, if you take the broadest possible view, which is not necessarily what you wanna do, uh, then puzzles are pacing uh, in a game. Puzzles are what keeps the whole game from happening all at once gives the player a reason to slow down and think about where they are, think about what they're doing, think about the story, even though the story might not be directly related to the puzzle, and make a decision about what to do next. And that's that's the interactivity that uh, makes games a me the medium that they are. That is a super cool thought that I had never had. Puzzles is pacing. Um, Kieran, what do you think? Um, they have so many different uses. I mean, they can act as great door locks in games you know do you need to seal off a chunk of content from people until they've explored other bits of content you see that a lot in video games you have to find certain items they can also be used i think to um show character like if you have if you're and and sort of the some of the story if you're in a certain environment like if you're in a, a heavily industrial area you're and you've got a puzzle, it's probably going to reflect that and it might reflect the character who set it. Um, so it can tell you a lot about the world you're in. Yeah, that's definitely that too. Um, I'm, I'm taking notes because I think this is all <laughs> awesome and I might want to bring it up later. Uh, Curtis, what do what do puzzles in games do? Um, so I, I, uh, I think they they can serve a number of different purposes, and that's one of the cool things about them is that people are able to use them to do different things like pacing or revealing things. And um, uh, so some of the folks watching are probably also writers in addition to being you know interested in gaming. And I think it's interesting to think of. Um, I know we're going to talk about ludo narratives specifically later, but you can think of you know when you're um, 
experiencing a piece of fiction or something that is you know, completely linear and non-interactive, um, there are things in that you can think of as like a puzzle, right? Because you learn a thing about a character or the plot moves forward and that sort of unlocks another part of the story, similar to uh, what you know, folks were just saying about, you know, this puzzle unlocks this part of the game, like sometimes it's literally like you open this other room that you can now explore or do something. Um, and that, and uh, I think in, in more recent years, it's, it's, it's become more common for some games to be like more explicitly puzzle oriented, which is interesting to see because sometimes um, like there's um, the one that comes to mind is a, a a thing called Steven Sausage Roll, which I don't know if people are familiar with. It's like this weird indie game. And it's very sort of like logic puzzly, and it's got like these um, low res kind of Minecrafty graphics, and like it's all about puzzles. It's like not really a story. Like there's a character, but you don't care who he is really. You just you just <laughs> got to roll the sausages into the right position, uh, in the right way, and um, and it in you know, and I think there are ways to talk about sort of how, you know, how much of a game is it if it's all puzzles and how much of a game do you want it to be? Mm -hmm. And if it's, if it is a puzzle game, then presumably, yeah, it's, yeah. it's all puzzles. Um, but, um, yeah, and, and that brings to mind also just the, we're leading into the next question a little bit as in terms of like, what, what do people expect of puzzles? Um, so what, what do people from different backgrounds, familiarity levels, cultures, and so on, what, what do they bring to puzzles? Uh, and how do you think designers or writers can take those differences into account when creating puzzles in games? And, um, I, know, I think it was, was it Andrew who said that this was a specialty of yours or was it Kieran? Well, it's a special interest of mine. Okay, perfect. Uh, then I'm... take it, take it, Andrew. Um, one of the things that you see if you hang out on different uh, different puzzle different communities, game designer communities, puzzle developer communities, is that every one of them develops its own language. Not I don't mean like development language. I mean a way of talking about puzzles, way of interpreting puzzles, way of evaluating puzzles. And you know, the, uh, I mentioned the mystery hunt. Like the mystery hunt community has a strong sense of what's a good puzzle for this event. And they will go down into great detail about exactly what how clues should be presented, what needs to be left uncertain, what needs to be uh, made explicit. Whereas if you look at, you know, puzzle games from the 1970s and 80s, of which there were lots, uh, there was a completely different set of assumptions about what's good and what the game needs to do. And I was talking a little bit about this yesterday in a panel, uh, talking just about community, like communities have strengths and weaknesses and one of the strengths is that you develop this really intricate sense of what's what your audience wants and the, da the downside is when you try to move into a different community or play games from a different field you might not understand what the author is trying to communicate just because of the depth yeah and i think that you karen had brought up escape rooms as an example of something like this yeah one of the things uh i'd kind of discovered and, and looked into a bit is um so one of the games i made i they had to unlock a phone and check in the contacts mm -hmm. and i used an old iphone for this because it was what i had worked fine with my co-workers who are developers <laughs> uh, when i tried it with some other friends of mine they really struggled with it because they did not have the familiarity with what the iPhone looks like. Where do you look for the contacts on it? Mm. Which had never occurred to me because I'm also in, I, you know, I, I work with mobile phones um, <laughs> as part of my job and I'm so used to switching back and forth and it just never occurred to me. So it's one of the things you can never, in, in that kind of game where you're not building for a specific community, you're just making a thing to put out into the world for hopefully lots of people. You can't assume a base level of knowledge because it's going to be different for everyone. And, um, you know, across cultures, there are going to be, you, you might make assumptions about, this is off the top of my head, like, um, if you assume that everyone thinks that a certain color means a certain thing you're gonna get tripped up because it almost definitely does not mean that thing in another culture and 
someone is going to really struggle. So when looking at escape rooms in Skyrim, it's quite important to test with lots of people if you can, but also if there is certain knowledge that people need, it needs to be there for them. It needs to be present in the game environment um, for them to discover. You need, to, you know, with the color example, if you're using a color and it's like, oh, this means a terrible thing, you need to indicate that it means a terrible thing rather than just going, everyone knows this color means a terrible thing. Yeah, don't, don't assume what everyone knows. Um... Um, again, I'm like furiously taking notes. Curtis, how does that tend to translate? Because you, like you said, have these events that you run kind of all over the the place, generally non non pandemic. But so how does how does that kind of you know different backgrounds, different familiarity levels and cultures uh, apply there? Yeah. So I mean, the the specific thing that we've had to deal with in Puzzle Pint is you know we started in the U.S. Uh, on the West Coast, and kind of expanded outward from there, and now we have. Um, we have Puzzle Pint, or we had cities running Puzzle Pint, you know, early last year before we all had to shut down um, in places where there were not necessarily a lot of native English speakers, right? In uh, places like Poland and the Czech Republic and, um, you know, in Taiwan um, and in India. Um, and so India was kind of like the weird exception where you could expect a lot of people knew English, but even there, they wouldn't be familiar with a lot of, you know, like current American pop culture or specific references or like really, really intricate wordplay of the kind you might see at, you know, uh, an MIT mystery hunt or like a, a cryptic crossword level stuff that you get in the UK where like there are like five levels of puns that you yeah. and the jargon of the particular cryptic that you need to understand. Because, oh, it means an anagram, but you take out the first half and then you do this other thing. Um, so, so it's been challenging because, and, and the other thing with Puzzle Pine is we, we've always still wanted to be beginner friendly so that even if you come into this, you haven't done any sort of these kinds of puzzles before where it's, it's always kind of a you know, hidden message thing where you, know, you get something that may look like a crossword and okay, you do, you fill in like a crossword, but then after that, you do like another step that gets you, you know, uh, a, a word or a code phrase or a name out of it. And that's the, the answer that you then, you know, want at the end of the night. Um, so, yeah, we've, we've definitely had, you know, playtesting really helps us because now that we have people in all these places, we can ask them like, you know, people in the UK or outside the US, like, hey, can you uh, just sort of check us on this? Like, is this reference what we think it is? everywhere like or should we not use this word like are there spelling differences like sometimes that matters like if there's an extra u in the word after the o it's like well like people in the u.s are going to do this but uh, you, you know in canada they're going to do this and if we can you know, make that irrelevant to the actual solving of the puzzle that's ideal um but yeah. i do, I, I do want to say that um i i really like it when you know uh, if you're doing an Especially when you're doing an in person event, when you're able to, you know, engage things that are a little unexpected, um, like, you know, senses other than just like sight, right? Not just reading stuff, but like if you have to listen for something or, um, you know, you have to feel something or smell is very tricky. <laughs> you know, kind of trying to do smell puzzles. Um, and obviously that, um, that does present accessibility issues for certain people. Um, mm -hmm. So, it's important to sort of, I, I think as a creator, you want to keep in mind, like, okay, what do I want people to get out of this experience and how can I make it the best experience for everyone, even if they have, you know, some kind of, you know, issue. And, and I will say for, for smells specifically, we have found, um, after doing this multiple times, like, um, you know, people who identify as male, aren't good at smelling things and <laughs> telling you what they smell like. like oh. that's, and maybe this is, you know, purely a Western thing in the US, like, you know, men are not socialized to like understand fragrances. <laughs> like, that's interesting. How do we exploit that? <laughs> and and how do you play test for that? Which, I mean, I guess you sort of now know. Um, a Andrew, was there yeah. something that you wanted to add? Um, I was just thinking of a, an example puzzle where there was a taste 
like a tasting puzzle and there was a big allergy warning on it. Like if you have any aller aller allergy issues, do not taste the random powders. And everyone's like, well, I guess they had to say that. Yes. Uh, okay. Yeah. Cause it's like, you could have lots of like, I'm allergic to avocados. I don't, <laughs> not peanuts. Like, um, but I'm actually going to go back to something that you mentioned uh, previously, Curtis, which is about uh, how you wanted um, Puzzle Find to be beginner friendly. Uh, so one of the challenges in games is scaling difficulty. Um, how do you handle crafting puzzles that are difficult enough to make the player feel clever? Because that's part of the joy of puzzles, right? Is that you solve it and you feel smart and you feel cool that, that you did it. Um, so difficult enough to make, make the player feel clever, but not so difficult that they rage quit. And I'm gonna ask Kieran to to kick us off on this one. Um, I'm I'm very familiar with the rage quit prop <laughs> thing in uh, I have played video games and uh it's gonna be different for everyone. Everyone has else everyone has their own point where um the puzzle will become unsustainable. Uh, I think in a lot of games, I'm thinking especially video games, you have to consider is the puzzle worth the reward um are they going you know if if it's a really if it's a puzzle that's really tough um is it are they getting a uh, comparatively good thing at the end are they getting some really important new information that will help them on every future puzzle or further in the game um because uh i'm thinking uh, one example of this was um, uh, I played Guild Wars 2 and they have a lot of jumping puzzles. So these are ones where you have to work out the route mm -hmm. and figure out how to get there and the agility. And I managed to get to the top of this really difficult one. I'd been working at it for about 45 minutes and it was really naff equipment oh, at the end. And it was just like, the worst. Well, I don't want to do it anymore. And you just feel let down. Mm -hmm. um, whereas if if I'd got something, you know, comparatively rewarding, it would have been like, oh, that's cool. I feel good for doing it. And I think it's really important, you know, is the time that someone is going to be spending on this worth what they are getting in return? Um, mm -hmm. And and I think that's a, a pretty good thing to be considering and to be measuring. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Andrew, what do you think? Uh, well, I mean, in the Guild Wars example, it's also true that if you had been much better, like a much more skilled jumper yeah. and just gotten to the top in a few minutes, you wouldn't have minded it at all. So this is, it's really based on what the player knows. Uh, the, like a difficult, I think of a really, not necessarily a difficult puzzle, but a really interesting puzzle is one where it relies on everything you know and also one more twist that you didn't think of. Mm -hmm. But that means that without the orientation of what you know already, there's no way to say how difficult the puzzle is. Mm -hmm. um, that's where that's where you're dealing with the audience, dealing with like the, the set of things that they already understand, and having having that known audience makes uh, much more sensible to talk about what the difficulty rating of a puzzle is. Yeah, um, and like. Again, your audiences can vary widely if you have something mm. that is like a very specific group of people, kind of like Curtis was describing, you know, the MIT folks. It's like, yeah, they've got all their in-jokes, their knowledge, you know, they, exactly. they know what's going on. But if you have a broader group, it's harder to identify mm. that scale. Um, Curtis, what is, again, you like you said, you want to keep stuff beginner friendly. So how do you scale this stuff? Yeah, so it can be tricky. And, you know, sometimes we do get feedback where, you know, it can be hard to sort of hit the sweet spot, right? Where, mm -hmm. you know, and I, for, for me, I think the key is that, you know, even if you have to, you know, give someone a nudge and explain like, oh, have you thought about, like, have you considered that this could be some kind of code? And, and we always have a code sheet available. So like, have you looked on the code sheet and looked at like, there's like Morse code and Braille and semaphore and just, mm -hmm. you know, converting numbers to letters, which is a thing we do a lot. <laughs> <laughs> puzzled by um, and also just uh, a concept like indexing uh, which I think is a very specific term but it, it just means you know if you have say a, a, a word and then you have a, a number associated with that word then you you know count that many letters into the word and you take that letter and you repeat this for you know a number of words and you get a new word out of it 
Um, that's sort of a very basic thing that, you know, if you're a beginner, you've never done this before, you might not think to try, but it is something that you could explain to someone and you can like give them that hint and they're like, oh yeah, I can do that. Um, and it's not some big complicated thing that they have to go off and learn and then come back and do the puzzle. It's like, you can, you know, just show them and they get it right away. Um, so that's kind of, for me, I think that is the sweet spot where like, you know, it, the mechanism depends on something that is, you know, pretty straightforward like that. But then the way that it's used in the puzzle, there may be like another layer on top of that, that is a little more interesting and maybe more challenging to see. But once you have done that first step, you can then, you know, do the next thing. And that's kind of, as a creator, that can be difficult to sort of, you know, because you're giving the puzzle, uh, in, like in Puzzle Point, we, you know, give out uh, like the puzzles have to be uh, a paper, right? Because we were doing this at bar, so it's like you have to be able to print a black and white piece of paper for your puzzle. Um, and now it's all online, so you just download the PDF. Mm -hmm. um, but it's like you, you, you have to be able to like give it to them and then they, they go off and do it on their own. And because everything is already there, sort of, you know, uh, it's harder to control like which thing they see first, right? Like if it were a video game or something interactive, you could say, oh, you don't see this part until you unlock this thing. But uh, on paper, it's like, well, it can be a trickier design thing. Um, but the other, the other really cool thing that we see, um, sort of going back to the, you know, the cultural uh, knowledge <laughs> thing, is that you know we encourage people to to solve in teams at Puzzle Point uh, because again, when you're going to a bar, hopefully you're going to the bar with your friends, and you're just going to hang out, and you might happen to do some puzzles. Either way, it's going to be fun for you. Um, and it's really gratifying. Like we'll see a lot of teams of like, you know, four people. So it's like two couples that show up and people, and usually you'll get like four puzzles for the night. And each person will like grab a puzzle. It's like, oh, this looks interesting. I'll try this for a while. And then they get stumped and then people like trade puzzles and someone else like, oh yeah, you know, I see this other thing that you didn't notice. And so that's really cool to see people working together and like educating each other on mm -hmm. their little gaps in knowledge. Yeah, it's like in person Reddit. What? No, sorry. <laughs> yeah. It's like getting on the old message board back when Mist was out, and you're like, I don't understand any of this. Please help. Um, so now, spe and speaking of video games, um, we're going to go into our next question. But I just want to note we're about the halfway point, and so if anyone in the audience has questions, please feel free. We are in Swooperton B in the Discord. Uh, if you wouldn't mind putting "question" in all caps in front of it, just to catch my attention, um, and then we'll answer. It. We have two more questions, and then we'll get to the audience questions. Um, so the next question is is not necessarily totally video game, but we're going to get jargony. The term Ludo narrative, for those who haven't heard it, re refers to the intersection in a video game of the gameplay elements and the narrative elements. So, um, what are what are some approaches to integrating puzzles into games, not necessarily just video games, um, that you think have worked particularly well when considered as part of the narrative whole? Um, and I'm going to have Andrew start us on this one. Sure. Um... Well, you mentioned Myst. Uh, what that game did really well was have puzzles that made sense as part of the world you were exploring. Mm -hmm. um, you, like you're not just translating symbols; you're translating symbols that are the language of the the people of the island that you're exploring. Uh, you're not just flipping switches; you're turning on and off pipes that control machinery, like that fill up a pool. You can see the pool fill up. You can see the door open. Mm -hmm. uh, there's an interconnection, there's a logic, like someone built this machine to do something. Um, and by solving the puzzle, you're understanding how the world works. Now, there, and there's always a little bit of artifice. There's always, mm -hmm. you know, the, the machine is broken in just such a way mm -hmm. that it's really tricky to figure out how to solve it. And the player understands that this is a puzzle and they, but the game is trying to help them suspend their disbelief mm -hmm. and feel like they're, they're actually engaged in something. And that's something like the, the very earliest um, puzzle adventure games were just like random mismatch, mishmashes of you know machines and caves and ladders and buildings and so forth. But as the field developed, mm -hmm. you had more and more story and more and more naturalism in trying to make the, uh, the this everything work together as a whole. Yeah, I like that word naturalism. Um, Curtis, give us your thoughts. Uh, yeah, I, I think. Uh, I've seen a lot of really interesting ways in which um, 
story is revealed through the actions that you take in the game world to solve puzzles. Um, so a couple of examples uh, I can think of. I just started playing this game last night because of a, another panel uh, at Flex of Foundry that I saw where they're talking about games. Uh, it's a mobile game called Hollow Vista. Mm -hmm. um, that people have seen, um, and it's, you know, it's presented in the form of like a, you're basically like interacting with your, with the phone as if you're on social media. So you're like taking pictures and like reading chats, but it's mm -hmm. all sort of in the game world. So when you look through the phone, you're seeing like another space. Um, and it, and the, the, the tasks are sort of, you have to take a picture of this thing and then like post it on your feed. Um, and it fills in a text for you that goes with the picture, which is mm -hmm. like, you can find a picture that matches this text. Mm -hmm. um, but then what the text is saying is telling you, you know, more and more about the world. And it's sort of, in some sense, proceeding in real time because you're like actually doing this on your phone. It's like, I do this all the time. It's great. <laughs> um, and the other thing um, I was thinking of, it's, a, it's a, a virtual reality game called, I think it's called Fisherman's Tale. Mm -hmm. Um, which uh, I I played on the the Oculus Quest. I don't know if it's available on mm -hmm. other platforms, um, but that was sort of a really interesting thing. Where as you go through, like it's kind of mysterious at first, like what is actually happening, and it's a little bit surreal. But uh, you have this narrator telling you, "Oh, like do this thing now," and then you go do the thing, and then it kind of unlocks another area of the game and it reveals more about what is going on in the world. And, mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think those kinds of things can work really well when you're able to have that kind of immersive experience. You know, in VR, it's like you're you know really in the world, mm -hmm. and the phone, it's like you know you understand that interface, and it feels mm -hmm. feels more real to you in that way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, assuming again, like uh, unlike with Kieran's example, it's like you did, <laughs> assuming you know how to use the phone. In which mm -hmm. case, if you don't, sure. uh, yeah. yeah. So, Kieran. Um, so a couple of examples that I was thinking where they have gone to great pains to make sure that the puzzles feel extremely grounded in the mm -hmm. world and the narrative. So you've got um, the portal games, oh yes, where the whole setup is that you have to go through puzzles and you are being taunted by an evil AI, <laughs> and um, especially um, in the Portal Two main plotline. Um, the way you go through is um, each puzzle you have teaches you something uh, that fits in the world. You see the research, you see, mm -hmm. uh, so you know why these objects are there and mm -hmm. that there was a reason for these puzzles to exist. And you also learn things that help you at the end of the game. Mm -hmm. um, so it's not just here are some random puzzles and eventually they will stop. It's here are some random puzzles and you are learning skills yeah. that will eventually, uh, you know, you will that mean you will eventually be able to finish the game. Nothing is wasted in that. Mm -hmm. And another example that I think has the same grounding in the world is actually Untitled Goose Game, <gasps> which yes. is um, uh, it's not a goose doing a heist, you know, it's not, uh, it's certainly this kind of bucolic English village and it's, you know, the goose is doing goose things. All of it is things that a real goose could potentially do. And none of the, you know, none of the people have these like keypad locks on their gate, on their gates. Um, you know, there aren't robots, there's nothing to fight. It's mm -hmm. all things like, you can nick things and move it around and sometimes there's a hole in the hedge and uh, it means you really have to think uh, about you have very limited actions but and tasks puzzle tasks to complete and it all feels completely integrated there's nothing where you go well a goose couldn't do that <laughs> or I don't understand why I don't understand why this pub has a laser grid that I have to get through. Um, so they're, they're just games that are very solidly grounded in. We have a reason for the puzzles and the environment fits these puzzles and the actions that you can take are the actions that will get you through these puzzles without being uh, 
feeling unnecessary you know it's in portal it's like you have the portal gun you don't suddenly come across a bazooka mm -hmm. yeah absolutely oh portal when the when the ceiling opens <laughs> you're just like oh no um this, this sort of um leads into the, actually the next question since you just talked about a game i enjoy uh what what are some of your favorite puzzle games or what are some favorite puzzles in non-puzzle games or in physical experiences or like other like escape rooms stuff like that um let's start with curtis on this one uh yeah so agree i love the portal games and especially portal 2 when you do the multiplayer with another mm -hmm. person like that is fantastic because not only does it force you to figure out the puzzles like you also have to work with this other human like i mean you're both robots in the game but like you're, you're talking to this other person it's like okay no you have to do the no you have to do no wait for me no. <laughs> <laughs> Gotta time it. Just, Gotta, yeah yeah and it and it it is a really great um it's a yeah and it's, it's a lot of fun because you know, as a as a person, I feel like, you know, it, it made me, you know, made me a better person because, you know, my wife and I played it together and we had to like figure out communication, which is you know, also a good thing in a relationship generally. And it was like, but it was like this very structured way to like figure out how to talk to each other. Um, and now we're playing the overcooked games, which are like even more complicated, like in some ways than Portal because um, and, and another great game, and you can play with like a ton of people at the same time. And you're these little cartoon chefs, and you can run around and cook things. And, um, and it is interesting because they present you with a problem, and you have to figure out how to how to solve it. Like you know, okay, you have to get this thing over here as quickly as possible, but it, the precise way you do it is kind of up to you and may depend on how many people you're playing with like is it two people is it three is it four how do you divide up the task and what is the best way for you specifically to work with each other um so i really like uh, games where that is possible like where you where you're you know kind of given an open-ended question it's like okay solve this task and you have lots of options to do it um so i like I like in um, you know in a lot of video games there will be these sort of lock puzzles. You're like, oh, you have to solve this Sudoku to unlock the spaceship, but if you had 50 credits, you could pay for a hack to unlock it right away. It's like, yeah, let's just spend the money. I don't have time for this right now. Um, so I really like you know as a minor point, I like it when you know, the designers have taken that into account. It's like, okay, yeah, not everyone likes Sudoku, uh, and there are ways for you to make money in world. So yeah, just you know, just do that instead. It's so funny because I remember the Sudoku and Andromeda, Mass Effect Andromeda, and I yeah, remember yeah. the first time I realized, I was like, oh, this is, okay, so they're not doing Tower of Hanoi now, it's Sudoku, <laughs> all right, all right. Um, <laughs> Kieran, uh, same question, some favorite puzzle games or puzzles in non-puzzle games or other stuff? One of the first ones I did, which will always have a place in my heart, is Riven. Oh my gosh. Um, <laughs> because I... I actually just played it with the answers because there was no way I was ever going to get some of these puzzles, but I still felt a huge sense of accomplishment and just this amazement at going through and figuring out the number system that they had and uh, being able to go right back to the start and see things that I'd only glimpsed through like a gateway but hadn't been able to access. <laughs> Um, and it was just really satisfying being able to, uh, you know, return to places and see more things and discover discover new things about it and reach new places. Um, and one uh, that's come up more recently, um, uh, The Return of the Obradin. Oh, yes. I was um, gonna which about, yeah. has, um, it, which it kind of has a similar thing going on is that you, uh, it's it's got so many layers. So you do the first layer and mm -hmm. try and solve the puzzle and then you go to to the next kind of time jump mm -hmm. and it's like oh it didn't happen this way it happened another way and um and you just keep getting deeper and deeper and discovering new facets to the whole design of it and discovering different people than you thought were involved in different events and then there are giant spider crabs and it's great <laughs> um but just that sense of 
every level of the overarching story and puzzle brings you new information and <laughs> adds more context. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm I'm typing that out. More information and context because yeah, that's really cool. Um, I'm going to kick it now to Andrew. Uh, how much time do I have? We um... we actually have a <laughs> decent amount, so I would say you can definitely take like four minutes, I guess, and then we'll start audience questions. <laughs> There have been so many great puzzle games recently. Uh, Oberdin was great. Um, uh, any, like, my favorites of recent years, the, just the past couple of years, uh, Baba is You, Outer Wilds, and A Monster's Expedition, any one of which is, like, going to be an enduring classic that we're going to be looking at for the next 20 years in terms of sheer brilliant puzzle design. Um, but I also want to, because I'm old, uh, I want to go back and name some of the games that were inspirational to me back when I was younger. Uh, Revan is certainly on that list. Um, the Fool's Errand, which is a classic Mac game from uh, Cliff Johnson and mm. his uh, his later games, including Three and Three. These were, I'm, everyone is pretty sure that he invented the idea of the meta puzzle, mm. uh, like a, a giant puzzle story game that you go through and accumulate information at the end. You realize that everything you've learned is relevant to solving this extravaganza thing at the end. Uh, these were these were enormous classics and enormous influences on me. Um, and then, of course, like before that, all the Infocom text games going back in the 80s, like I can talk about them for an infinite amount of time. Uh, and I'm also going to name a completely bizarre thing, which is barely a puzzle game at all because it's completely unfair. There was a, a super early, like 1982 Apple II puzzle game called The Prisoner based on the TV show, okay. which was just totally trying to get in your head and screw with you. There were puzzles in there, and I don't understand how anyone... I, I, it's intended to be monstrous. It's intended to be just, as, as the original TV show, just con consistently mess with your head from one end to the other. Um, fake you out one way or the other. It's the kind of game where when you start reading the source code to try to figure out how it works, you might be playing it the way the author intended because it's all about cheating. What? <laughs> that, just... That's like, that's meta. Go ahead, Curtis. <laughs> Yeah, I just want to um, echo and amplify Andrew's recommendation for the Outer Wilds. And, and just to be clear, it's not the Outer Worlds, which mm -mm. is a big like, <laughs> RPG game that came out the same year. This is Outer Wilds. It's a little indie game, and it is, it is fantastic. Like I went into it not knowing a ton about it, and just learning everything. So about we're not it. going to say a ton about it. <laughs> yeah, and like I want to play it again. Like even knowing everything that you know happens in, and like knowing you know what i have to do i'm like i just want to have that experience again it was so fabulous well it's like Kieran was saying sometimes even if you literally have the guide in front of you and you know exactly how to solve a puzzle it's still deeply satisfying to do it just because they're so cool and experiencing them is still fun and cool um any love for the sierra games <laughs> that wasn't my background although uh, i did of course loom was uh, a classic Mm -hmm. That was Lucas Arts. All right. Um, so we have reached the end of my questions for y'all, but we do have an audience question. So I'm going to head over to that. Uh, what are the panel's favorite Nintendo puzzle games? Anybody want to take a stab at that one? Just raise your hand. I'll call on you like a teacher. Hmm. I didn't have a Nintendo. I'm sorry. Oh, it's all right. <laughs> yeah, this is like putting you on the spot, thinking hard. Hmm. I mean, uh, we're playing a lot of Animal Crossing right now. So, <laughs> <laughs> the main Nintendo experience currently. Um, I'm trying to think about if I played any like explicitly puzzle focused games back in the day. Because, like I said, like in some sense, you can think of all of these. You know, you know, figuring out how to play the game is kind of mm -hmm. a puzzle in itself, and it can mm -hmm. have you know different layers of complication depending on mm -hmm. what the game is right like, like Kieran was saying like do you have to like acquire the physical like manual dexterity to time things right and learn the mm -hmm. points, like like a fighting game right like yeah. puzzle. like remember this combo and do it at the right time um 
or is it, you know, remember the map and like go the right mm -hmm. place uh, and follow the thing or whatever. Yeah. Um, yeah. Like a battle toads or a Mega Man or something. Yeah. I I also did not have a Nintendo until I got the DS <laughs> years ago. But I mean, recently, really enjoying, like I say, Untitled Goose Game. Just a really fun, satisfying puzzle game. Um. Yeah, I yeah. have not played a huge number of Nintendo <laughs> games. Sorry. Yeah, I will throw a uh, yeah a Switch game that is I believe called Unravel Two. Oh. Um, that one's really adorable, and it is a, a puzzle game. It requires two players, I think. You might be able to play with one, but it is definitely much more fun with two. Um, so Unravel Two, and spelled out the word two because it's two player. Um, all right, let me see if we had other questions. Um, None yet. And so um, I will ask a question unless one magically pops up in the next three seconds because somebody's typing. Um, and my question is actually about, uh, again, what we were just talking about right now, the, the notion that you can still have satisfaction from the puzzle even if you already know how it goes. So can you think of any puzzles, uh, puzzle games or, or puzzles that um, on replay were just as satisfying, if not more satisfying, because you could kind of see how the pieces fit together the second time around. Well, I do try to replay adventure games that I really liked. And uh, for example, like, I, you know, there's a remake of Myst, which is now out on uh, Quest 2, and it's coming out for PC soon. I'm looking forward to replaying that. Uh, also, like uh, the Room series by Fireproof Games, mm. Um, those stand up really well to replay just because the environments are so nice and the, the feeling of just messing, playing with a puzzle box with your hands is so satisfying. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Anyone else have any thoughts on that one? Or if not, I can go to the audience question. I mean, just to, to agree with that, basically, mm -hmm. um, I think the, and I think the, the specific, the puzzle box example is a good one, right? Like, uh, like we have a couple of these at home and they're like physical things that you know there's like a trick to opening them once you know the trick you you can open them pretty easily but it's still satisfying because like like you you know the secret and you are <laughs> using your secret knowledge <laughs> and you can actually physically feel the thing and you can see the result and i think that's part of what uh, andrew's talking about with the room uh, Yes. games it's like you can see the result of your action and it's like this really nice immersive environment mm -hmm. they definitely got all the the kind of tactile feedback was really lovely in those um yeah just like being able to click open secret compartments and and it, it it's kind of as close as you can come to actually having a puzzle box mm -hmm. yeah. but actually, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm really looking forward to like doing escape rooms in person again. <laughs> I did a virtual one, um, which was not really the same. <laughs> there was a guy in the room with a, like a camera on his head. I oh, felt yeah. bad for him because like, there were like five of us all yelling at him like, no, look oh, up here now, no. open that thing, look at that. <laughs> Poor dude. Um, all right, so audience question, and then I think we may end up running out of time, but we'll see. Uh, do you have any specific examples of puzzles being used well and being well integrated in tabletop RPGs? Anybody have thoughts on that? Again, I don't play so many uh, tabletop RPGs. Mm -hmm. um, I'm going to take the, uh, the question off slightly to the side. There is a, um, a graphic novel called Meanwhile by Jason Chica, mm -hmm. uh, which is a choose your own adventure comic book. So it's a, it's a book game rather than a tabletop game, but it is essentially a, a puzzle. Like it's a, the story is given to you, but to understand what's really going on, you have to understand where everything is in the book and try different branches and try to and repeat it over and over. Um, I'm so I have an interest here because there's a, uh, a mobile version which I implemented that you can buy. But oh. it's the, uh, the the graphic novel is also in print and it's a great thing to play with and it's just it's a nice example of a super clever puzzle story integration in a book. That does sound super awesome. Anybody else want to take that in a different direction too? Feel free. 
Have you designed a puzzle for an RPG that you're especially proud of, maybe, or? I can't think of one. I mean, I, I don't run a lot of RPG campaigns mm -hmm. myself, but mm -hmm. I know when, when I've played them with other people, uh, like whoever's running the game has a lot of freedom to come up with, you know, something that the players have to solve you know, mm -hmm. in the world. Um, and uh, like my, my wife has run a lot of uh, campaigns for, for her friends and I've played in some of them. And sometimes she will like, just like, Put a like a physical puzzle on the table. It's like so you find this thing and you have to solve it now. Mm -hmm. <laughs> are there any? This is a side question because um, I see puzzle craft in the background. There are there any resources that you folks like to turn to or have found useful in creating puzzles um, or in just learning about puzzles generally? I mean, I can jump in since I have the yeah, book here. Go for it. Um, yeah, so PuzzleCraft is like, it's a great sort of survey of a lot of different kinds of puzzles, uh, mm -hmm. like Selinger and Thomas Snyder. Mm -hmm. um, and, they, and, they, and they also go through like, this is how you would construct this type of puzzle and where you might use it you know, as part of you know, some other event or, or thing that you're designing. Mm -hmm. um, the Puzzle Pint archives are free and online for anyone to look at. Um, all the solutions are there too. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so you can like download the puzzle and if you have a solution if you are, are stuck. Um, and it, it's not so much sort of uh, an instruction manual, but you can kind of see the variety of different kinds of puzzles that different authors have made. And we're starting to do a thing now where we're featuring the author more so you kind of know where where it came from. So that's kind of cool. That's, that's really cool to highlight that. Uh, Kieran, Andrew? Uh, I think for me, one of the ones that came in quite handy when I was doing my first escape game is, um, I think they're called uh, lockpaperscissors.co. Mm -hmm. And they actually sell um, escape games that you can download and make, but they also have a lot of uh, useful ideas for doing the basic setup. So how can you, obviously, you're not going to be spending hundreds of pounds on a really sophisticated um, keypad for your first thing, but you can simulate it by having, uh, you know, zip ties and they have to unlock a pair of scissors. Mm. Um, so it has some really useful ideas for if you're wanting to make kind of physical escape room, what kind of puzzles can you do at home uh, and what equipment you can use and how to customize things. Mm -hmm. That sounds super, super awesome and very handy. Andrew? Uh, all of my background is just in playing games mm -hmm. and getting ideas. Yeah, no, it's all good. Um, all right, so we are now out of time. And so I would like each panelist to just reintroduce themselves and say where they can be found online. Once again, we are in Swooperton B in the Discord. So if you want to pass by there just to say hi and drop some links, uh, we will start with Andrew. Give us your outro. Um, I, I should say it backwards, shouldn't I? No, I'm Andrew Plotkin. Uh, I'm a game designer going back, way back. Um, I'm on Twitter at Zarf Eblong, and my website for buying games and stuff is ZarfHome.com. All right, Kieran? Uh, I'm Kieran Roberts. You can find me on Twitter at Zali Camara. Yay, thank you. And Curtis? I'm Curtis C. Chen. Um, you can find me as that in most places. That's also my website. There are three C's, so, uh, except those substitutes. I am your uh, erstwhile host, Valerie Valdez. This is my cat, Wash, who has decided to return to us. Uh, you can find me online on Twitter at Valerie Valdez. If you are just listening, that is with an S, not a Z. And uh, you can find me at ValerieValdez.com. So thank you so much, everyone, for joining us. And I hope you have a lovely rush to the con. Once again, we're in Super Turn B, and I uh, hope you all have learned a lot today. I certainly have. Thank you so much, panelists. Bye. Thank you. Thank you.